This is an eardrums bound podcast train. Next stop, your headphones or speakers. Hello, before I continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First off, I wanted to give a big, big shout out to someone that helped with the audio of this episode and a re-upload of the previous episode, Brandon Grugel. Brandon is one of my good buds from Multitude. He works on Join the Party, does incredible editing there, and is one of the amazing hosts. And he helped me out editing the audio of this episode because I know last time was kind of shaky. And he remastered the track from last time. So if you go back, and re-listen to episode 69, it will sound a lot better. So thank you, Brandon, so much. And this leads me into a wonderful tie-in to give a shout-out to the show that he is on Join the Party. I was on the most recent episode of Join the Party, which is Multitude's Dungeons & Dragons Real Play podcast. It is a very different Dungeons & Dragons podcast from those you might know. It's basically like a Real Play podcast meets an audio fiction podcast where there's really good sound editing. You feel like you're immersed in the story. It's absolutely fantastic. I was on. It was so much fun. And if you need another podcast, podcast to listen to while you're waiting for Potterless episodes to show up, I recommend it. I also recommend all the other Multitude shows. We have the other show that I work on, Horse, which is a basketball podcast about everything except for the sport, just things like player drama and Twitter beefs. There's Spirits, which is like drunk history, except it's about mythology and very LGBTQ slash women focused, and it's very good and empowering, and they do really fun stories. And there's Waystation as well, which covers the Canadian TV show Lost Girl. Lots of fun things there, and we also have a ton of resources if you're starting your own podcast, if you go to multitude.productions. I love my multitudes, and I hope you support all of us by listening to our things and reading our resources. <laughs> Speaking of things that I love, we have new patrons. Welcome to the team. So shout out to Sanjana Pai, Selene, Anastasia Linus, Sydney Milburn, Sinya Hansen, Alexandra Calvi, Anna Katarina, Tegan Murphy, Elena Wolfson, Opal Moore, Natalie Schneider, Amy Michael, Jane Hawthorne, Cody Emmer, Jacob Weisblatt, Kristen, Daniel Francis, Brooke Dossett, Sebastian, Hannah Hawkins, and Graylin Blank. Shout out to Helen Bennett, who upgraded their pledge, and a huge shout out to Reese Clark and Adriana Cox, who upgraded to the producer level status, as well as our new producer level patrons, Brian, Ushin Large, and Yukamip Eats Waffles. They join the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Kieran, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamel, Russell, Dustin, Audra, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rossane, Andrea, Nikita, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Love, Kesh, Ali, Cassandra, Roxy, Emilia, Sean, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Jessica, Arna, Tiago, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Steve, Vivian, Takar, Haley Marino, Moster, Pinky, Angelina, Ross, Marie, Phineas, Lee, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Finn, Mosin, Grace, Sammy, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Heidi, Alexandra, John, Jen, Noel, Tao, Emily, Michael, Robin, Patricia, Will, Liz, Mariah, Brandon, Sarah, Clark, Teal, Cena, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Alicat, Hallie, Veronica, Kevin, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Lucinda, Carlos, Pam, Nikki, Colleen, Jennifer, Friede, Ivor, Naomi, Tyler, Summer, Heather, Vera, Kerry, Andrea, Topher, Ella, Anthony, Dead Cat Lady, David, Lisa, Lynn, Emily, Ryan, Cameron, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Kimberly, Srujan, Brittany, Nita, Bavi, Tumnus, Remy, Matt, Sarah, Lauren, Nona, Kyle, Zena, Emily, Colleen, Harlan, Akanksha, Wouter, Shelby, Noelia, and Can't I Potter? Who never accidentally have their phone left on front-facing mode when they're trying to take a regular picture. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus content, exclusive live streams, my notes, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless and join the team today. But without further ado, let's get into episode 70 of Potterless, covering chapter 19 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, guest starring Cecilia. Lynn Jacobs. So Harry wakes up after having some crazy Nagini dreams to it snowing. He finds Hermione reading a history of magic, and they decide to pack up and move to somewhere sheltered because she thinks she saw slash heard someone, so they should disapparate under the cloak. We'll learn that this person is important. So they do, (laughs) and they arrive at the Forest of Dean, a place that she went camping with with her family. Hermione produces a small blue flame that can be scooped up and put into a jar, which is so good. I know. This is amazing. It's like a portable nightlight that's more useful. Yeah. It's so good. She's also, like, this is her go-to. Like, she's been using this since the first book. Like, this is my very favorite. Has she used it in other places? Yeah. And did I just miss it? Yeah. Where else did she use this? Uh, first book. Um, Hermione had learned to conjure a bright bluebell flame that she could scoop around and carry around in a jam jar. She uses it to keep them warm in the courtyard when they're kicked out into oh, the courtyard right. during breaks in the winter, right. which is crazy. Yeah, terrible. Uh, she uses it to light Snape's robes on fire during the Oh, Quidditch that match. was that, right. That's that flame. Okay. Yeah, it's the same. Is that the same flame same she fire. used for the devil snare when at first she didn't realize that she could light it on fire? Yep. Okay. 
Oh, okay. Now I'm putting it yeah, all together. This is like her thing. It's a really good one. It's a really good thing. That's awesome. Oh, are you kidding me? It's like imminently practical, uh -huh. very powerful, very small. And it also sounds very cute. Really clean. Like a small blue cute flame. Cute and clean. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Crackling so, bluebell flames. Yeah. So two days later, Harry is on watch, and he can't shake the feeling that something is different. He sees a bright silver light moving through the trees, drifting towards him effortlessly. Guessing by the chapter, um, <laughs> so at this point I know, well, guessing by the chapter title, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, this is a silver doe. Is uh. that what that is? <laughs> wow, okay. Uh, I hate when the chapter title gives away. <laughs> it should always be ominous or like very obvious, like the life and lives of Albus Dumbledore. Like, oh, they're gonna get into the book. <sighs> so yeah. it's gotta be some sort of Patronus. And I had a few thoughts about this Patronus. The first of which was just, don't be Ginny's, don't be Ginny's. Ooh, creepy. I just don't want the dough to be some sort of connection to Harry's being a stag. And Correct. I have a theory about it later, which I'll get into, which okay. I unfortunately think is more likely. Mm. And it scares me, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge oh. when we get to it. Okay. So ha wait. Harry was just thinking about Ginny, which is why my initial thought was don't be Ginny's. Yeah. He was being a creep and trying to use the Marauder's Map to like spy on her, but it's Christmas. Oh my so she's not God. School. Yay. <laughs> this is my favorite. This is my favorite. Favorite. Like, this is Facebook like, creeping in the wizarding this, world. <laughs> yes, but, like, this is this thing that shows up over and over and over again, is that these teenagers handle, like, all of their romantic love and, like, feelings towards each other by just, like, either being mean or stalking each other. <laughs> or bursting into tears and running away. Yeah. And, like, you know, or, the like, three reactions. demanding unreasonable emotional stuff from them and or just, like, physical things. Like, Ron's relationship with Lavender Brown. Like, uh, why? Uh... So bad. The doe walks away. Harry tries to call it back, but to no prevail. Harry then chases after it, even recognizing that this may be a trap, which, come on, dude, just wake up Hermione, tell her what's oh, happening. I know, I know. Like, his brain even I thinks to himself, this is, could be really bad. Remember that time you just fell into a really bad trap and then almost got murdered? And he's oh. just, nah, mm, I'm good. I'm not going to wake up Hermione. Ugh. No, it's just really important that I just follow my feelings. Yeah. yeah. So Harry is led deep into the forest, and the doe stops, and Harry goes to ask the doe a question and it vanishes. Now Harry is scared, fearing some sort of ambush. And Harry then just straight up finds the sword of Gryffindor lying in the bottom of a frozen pool in the middle of the forest. And I thought it was funny that it said pool, which I guess is just a British way to say lake. But for half a second, I was like, there's a pool in the forest. Oh, no, no, no. The, no, this is not a suburban pool. Yeah. This is, this is, it's like there's a diving board, there's a slide, and then the sword of Gryffindor at the bottom. This is not, no, this is not your standard after soccer watering hole. Harry like, finds a YMCA. <laughs> Uh, Harry finds an Olympic-sized <laughs> infinity pool <laughs> in the forest of Dean. Oh, it actually like... means the forest of Deans <laughs> of the college he finds with one the of Olympic those... swimming pool. He finds one of those pools from Sky Mall that's just just big enough to fit oh, a person God. and no. sprays it. A, it's a just thing like a reflection pool. Yeah, it's like ankle no, deep. It's a small, it's a pool. Yeah. It's a pool. It's a small water. But like bigger pool. than a puddle. Not a full-fledged yeah, lake, it's a but... Pond. It's like a place where a spring is springing. Okay. But, like, it was lower than the rest of the ground, so now there's a pool. Okay. He still has yeah. to dive into it. It's big enough for it's, that. Yeah, they, they tend to... Yeah, I don't know. Like, how big is too big? What, what's the difference between a pool and a pond? Like, I uh... Know. I feel like I need I a like size a between a pool, like pond, a lake. A large pool is, like, ten feet. Okay. In diameter. Sure. It is Why now. <laughs> That's the technical term. John. You heard it here first. <laughs> Guys, I found my new calling. <laughs> <laughs> Deciding how big bodies of water are. Defining range and random stuff. How many is a few? Four or five. Guys. There it is. <laughs> Four or five. <laughs> So, I have so many questions at this point, but then, thankfully, a couple of them get answered. But the questions that I wrote down were, <laughs> what are the odds? Why is it here? Did the dough come from the sword or from someone else? Did the dough ever appear to the wrong person by accident? So many questions. But Harry asks some of the same questions aloud, which makes me feel happy, but then also sad that my brain is in the same place at Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> he tries Accio's sword, which 
doesn't work, but I appreciate. Anytime people do Accio for something, I great, appreciate it so much because if I was a wizard, I would do it all the time. All the time. Like, oh, I lost my keys, Accio keys. Chips. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're in the grocery store. What aisle is the pork oh, in Accio This pork. would be amazing. This would also, like, solve all, like, or not all, but many disagreements I've had with, like, significant others who are, like, a foot taller than me uh -huh. and, like, decide to place things really high up. <laughs> not cool. No, not but cool. a summoning charm would solve that. Yes. So I just appreciate when people do this charm when they're like, I don't know, Akio's sword, like, just give it a shot. So Harry recalls... I want that thing. Well, yeah, and Harry's done it a bunch of times where he's like, Akio Horcrux? <laughs> like, maybe? Oh, oh my God. Oh my. <laughs> so Harry oh. recalls when Dumbledore said that only a true Gryffindor could have pulled the sword out of the hat. So he tries to think of what he could do. He thinks the Gryffindors are best known for their daring, their nerve, and their chivalry. Mm -hmm. So Harry knows what he has to do. And you know what I think he has to do? Fucking wake up Hermione Granger yes. and tell him what you're going to do. Yes. This is not hard, but what Harry decides to do is just dive in and not take off the Horcrux, which eventually almost strangles him to death. Yo, but why don't just... you just go wake up Hermione? Just go run back. Summon Hermione. Yeah, Accio Hermione. <laughs> Accio Hermione. <laughs> Hermione, can you hold the Horcrux? <laughs> yeah, or not even. But it's, because Accio Hermione and a coat. It seems it's cold in the because of the thing is, their whole purpose is to find the sword. Yeah, he has found the sword. Yes. There's no reason that he has to do this right now. The dough no. is gone. There's no sense of urgency. Just go to Hermione and be like, "Hey, I found the sword. Can you spot me?" I don't know, dude. I think the whole, like, first half of the seventh or and or, like, arguably the entire seventh book is one giant sense of urgency, yeah. right? Like, I think that, like, a sense of, like, finding things and then having them immediately vanish <sighs> and the whole, like, perceptual <laughs> world being a little unstable is kind of a recurring theme in this sure. book. But he still should have gotten Hermione. That's yeah. exactly why he should have gotten Hermione. Mm -hmm. And also, like, why don't they have defense plans? If, I don't know. This is like, <laughs> this is like grade one they disaster should, preparedness, guys. They're, yeah, they're not the best at planning. No. As we saw in the ministry, but also Only they, they, Hermione is good at this. <laughs> but they should have Also, had... like, why is Hermione? Like, I'm the one who knows. I'm the only one who's going to think of taking the mm -hmm. beaded bag and packing it and just bringing along just in case. Yep. And I'm not going to make sure that my friends are also feel some sense of responsibility over like our collective welfare it's yeah. just going to be me Hermione Granger doing all the because work because of the patriarchy <laughs> sorry so annoyed no very annoying anyway they're not the best at planning they should have had no. some sort of code of like if yes. one of us finds the thing we're looking for and we're separating send a Patronus to get Hermione right? not hard not that hard not so that hard. he decides what he has to do is to dive in <laughs> 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 so Harry even thinks as to how chivalry fits in and can only think that he isn't asking Hermione to do it instead, which uh, I know like that. You're not, <laughs> you're not doing her any favors by not waking her up. Uh, so he's no, stripped. no, he's saying, well, you know, no, he's saying, well, at least I'm not making her he's saying, it. well, at least I'm not asking Hermione to dive into the freezing pool. Mm -hmm. oh, look how nice look I am. You, look how such of a good you, guy I am. Are you making a humor or are you just annoying? Or are you doing the bare minimum and thinking yeah. that you need a cookie for it? So he strips down, but doesn't remove the Horcrux. He hits the ice with Defindo. He puts his wand aside and then jumps in. It is super cold. And as he dives closer and closer, the Horcrux starts freaking out more and more. Since he's an idiot and he still has it on his neck, it starts strangling him. It becomes harder and harder to breathe. It gets to the point where he's about to drown and he blacks out, and he comes to face down in the snow, and his first thought is Hermione saved him, which was also my first thought. Yes. And I wrote in all caps, holy shit, Hermione is doing everything. <laughs> but Harry then realizes it is not Hermione. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. The locket is gone, and he hears someone say, are you mental? Which I knew was Ron right yes. off the bat, and then to sentences later it's confirmed that it is Ron. Ron has the sword in one hand and the Horcrux in the other and he asks Harry right off the bat why the hell didn't you take this thing off before you dived which one hard same and two isn't the word dove? I have no idea this okay. is like not the question for me. Okay I'm gonna google past Do. tense of dive. I think it's one of those where like it could be either. 
Should you use dived or dove? Miriam Webster. Thanks, Miriam Webster. Uh, let's see. Do tell us. Uh, they say both are correct. Weird. Yeah. Super weird. Well, I don't like when there's two answers, like cactuses or cacti. Just pick one. Just pick one. Also, Apparently, like, which one dove... happened first? And so what it says is dived was first, like a British English. And yeah. in the U.S., a more modern adaptation is to say dove. So I guess this weird. is the more British choice. But we should just all pick one. I don't like when there's two answers because then you just sound strange. Uh, I mean, like, that's like, that's how English goes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird one. So anyway, Harry's in disbelief, puts on all of his sweaters, and Ron says that Harry cast the Do Patronus. And Harry says, no, mine is a stag. And Ron goes, oh, right. Harry thought Ron did it. Ron doesn't really have a good reason for being back aside from feeling bad for ditching them. And Ron says he was looking around in the forest for hours until he saw the Patronus. Oh, yeah. I thought it looked different. Mm -hmm. No antlers. <laughs> Just absolute face palm. <laughs> Just like, good Christ, Ron. Uh, so Harry asks if he saw anyone else. Ron says yes, but he saw Harry dive in and not get up so he couldn't investigate. So Harry runs towards the spot where Ron said he saw someone, but they don't see anyone. Harry thinks that whoever cast the Patronus is the one who put the sword there. And this is where I get into my other theory, which I really hope is not true. Hmm. So the only kind of person that we think might have access to the sword is maybe Snape, but we don't really think he does because Dumbledore switched out the swords. But if Snape did this and his Patronus is a doe because Lily's is a doe and he loves Lily, I will be super upset. Now, this is contingent on a lot of things. This is contingent mm -hmm. on Lily's being a doe to match James's, because James's was also a stag, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So for this dumb theory to be true, it would be contingent on Lily's being a doe because James is a stag, and then Snape's being a doe yeah. because he loves Lily. And I hope this isn't true, but there's a chance that it might be, because I do know that Snape has a big old crush on Lily Potter. Yeah. And if this is it, I'm going to be so upset. <laughs> Why are you going to be so upset? I don't know. I just think the whole, like, your Patronus turns into the person that you have a big crush on thing uh. is dumb. And also, if James and Lily's Patronuses are thematically paired to be a male and a female version of an animal, I will also think that's super dumb. Because Correct. I think everyone should have their own Patronus, and it shouldn't be dependent off the person you love. Yeah. I get the whole your Patronus changing into someone, whatever. I think I'm, I would be most upset if Lily and James are stag and doe, because mm. that's just So this silly. is like, this is something that I'm very interested in. If this is like a thing, right, mm -hmm. then like... Patronuses are like a weird thing anyway. Yes. Like I would love to know more about a Patronus because they talk about how Tonks's Patronus switches to Lupin's. changes to something big and furry. Mm -hmm. They try to make you think it's a dog so that she's got a big crush on her first cousin once removed, gross. which is gross. But then you learn it's Lupin, so gross. it's less gross, even no. though he's well, a lot older than her. Gross. Yeah, is it gross? Her with Lupin, it's not gross. It's not bad that it's not gross. gross in terms of first cousin once removed gross. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of like, oh, all right. It's just like a like um unconventional. Uh what's his nose in Catherine Zeta Jones gross? Who's what's his nose? <laughs> Michael Douglas. Oh, there Michael we Douglas. go. <laughs> Michael what's his nose That's a Douglas. Really old reference. Star of the American presidents. <laughs> yes. I'm like trying to think of like other pairings of like old people and young people. I mean, Billy Bob Thornton and Angelina Jolie were a big age difference, I feel. Oh, that was back in the day. Yeah. Hugh Hefner and anyone. Yeah. But that's like super creepy and, and purely yeah. for money. And yeah, we're very happy he's dead. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going <laughs> rest in peace, Hugh. Um, but no, I'm just... <laughs> I mean, I don't think anyone's going to write me a hate mail. I love Hugh Hefner. That guy Hugh was super not creepy. Perfect American. <laughs> yeah. Model that guy was citizen. totally normal. Yeah, okay, cool. Yes, I mean... I'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I guess, well, like, who else could it be, really? Yeah, I don't like, know. Like, who... Mm, it's not McGonagall, because hers is a cat. Mm -hmm. It could be, like, some mysterious other human. Mm -hmm. 
That we don't know about yet. Yeah, it could be someone we don't know. It could be Dumbledore from the Onzi Oh, oh Dumbledore. It could be Mad Eye Moody if he's not actually dead, but I feel like his Patronus wouldn't be a doe. I feel like it would yeah, be something that's way. Like the least moody <laughs> Patronus ever. Yeah, I'm trying to think who it could be. It could be Ginny, but then I would also be mad. I feel like Moody's Patronus is like a Velociraptor. <laughs> 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 yeah, just some really ugly bird. Yeah. <laughs> Like, uh, with some fighting talents. Yeah, um, like an angry ostrich. Yeah, something like that. Like mm -hmm. an emu. An emu. An something emu, to be like, yeah, something I, this like... bird will fuck me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry feels the Horcrux twitch, so he decides to kill the locket once and for all. Harry says that Ron should do it because Ron got the sword and he has this realization if Dumbledore has taught him anything, it's about taking actions that have some sort of meaning behind them and it just seems fitting, which honestly, after all the bullshit we've seen in these books, seems like the right call. <laughs> so Harry says that he will open the locket using parcel tongue and then Ron will stab it. Ron doesn't want to because he feels it affects him too strongly. He reveals that when he was wearing the Horcrux, it really got to him feelings-wise, and that's what made him want to leave. Not that he's trying to make an excuse for himself, but he doesn't have a good relationship with this locket, and we will soon learn why. So Harry gives Ron a pep talk, and they decide to go for it. Harry opens the locket, and there's an eye on each side of the locket, and of course, narrator Harry calls the eyes handsome. It's the pre-scarlet slit Tom Riddle eyes, so before he got mm. gross and snake-like, because ew, so ugly once he's a snake. Harry is holding the locket, which puts a lot of trust into Ron's aim, honestly. He's holding a tiny locket, yeah, right? and he's like, shank this thing, please, Ron. Which, <laughs> what? Yes. Ron Weasley? <laughs> oh, God, what a weirdo. Uh, no, Ron, not known for his aim, mm -hmm. Ron. But just anyone. No, I, it's just... okay, Weasley is our king. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it's going to be fine. It's going to be totally fine. <laughs> so then the locket gets super creepy, and it tells Ron, I have seen your soul. I have seen your heart, and it is mine. I have seen your dreams, Ronald Weasley, and I have seen Don't your fears. To it. All your desires are possible, but all that you dread is also possible. Stop! <laughs> Voldemort then calls him the least loved Weasley child and loved less than Harry by Hermione, which I think is just kind of like fun, like no one in your family likes you and your girlfriend has a crush on your best friend. Like he's I just know. getting into like petty dumb arguments. I know, but this is the locket, right? It's, like the locket's yeah. thing is like mm -hmm. it gets at people's insecurities and mm -hmm. poor Ron is like devastatingly insecure. Totally. Well, like just wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ron. So then it uh, ups things to to level 11 because a deformed funky Harry and Hermione start to come out of the locket. Oh god, this thing. And they this are voiced gross. by Tom Riddle and they eventually take the full body form of them standing in the locket and the two of them start talking shit to Ron. Why return? <laughs> yeah, we didn't miss you at all. We were better off without you and I love Harry. Why would I ever love you? So then <laughs> Harry is just constantly screaming like, Ron, just shank this thing already please oh, yeah. but Ron is absolutely just caught in a trance by it the two kids I don't know what to call them the book keeps calling them like Riddle Harry and Riddle Hermione mm -hmm. so Riddle Harry and Hermione with Voldemort's voice continue their shit talking so then Harry keeps screaming and what finally motivates Ron to stab the locket is that the Riddle Harry and the Riddle Hermione kiss and that gets Ron so mad that he raises the sword but when Harry sees Ron raise the sword he thinks his eyes are scarlet so he's afraid that he's gonna shank Real Harry. Yes. So Harry dives out of the way. I mean, Ron's been, like, proven to be a little unreliable on shit like this. Totally. So Harry dives out of the way, but then he looks and sees that Ron has shanked the locket, and the Horcrux is dead, and all things are good. So Harry then puts his arm on Ron's shoulder and says that Hermione was so sad to see him gone. And she was crying for a whole week and honestly probably would have been crying for more, but she was trying to hide it from Harry. Harry clarifies that his love for Hermione is pure sister love, which I agree and which I believe in. And I'm very confused that people think that Harry and Hermione should have gotten together. I don't think it makes any sense. Ron apologizes for ditching and being a prat and all of that. And they go back to the tent. They wake Hermione and 
at first the narrator says that Hermione launches herself towards Ron and oh. I thought it was going to be like oh look a fun warm embrace no, no. not a fun warm embrace she no. starts punching him and saying things she starts with saying you complete us Ronald Weasley which first okay Jerry Maguire like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> come on I don't know when this book came out versus when Jerry Maguire but I'm pretty sure Jerry Maguire was a late 90s movie and this book was like early 2000s so come on J.K. Rowling it gets worse and worse she keeps yelling at Ron saying that he never should have left them and how can he just come back expecting everything to be okay she asks Harry to give her her wand so that obviously she can do some sort of crazy spell to Ron yeah. but Harry then puts Bertego between them Ron tries to apologize but then goes on to say I don't know what else to say besides I'm sorry Hermione hits him with rack your brain it should only take a couple of seconds which yes. whoa, that's very good it's very good. Uh, <laughs> I love it when Hermione mm. really takes a piss out of Ron. He so yeah. deserves it. What a little worm. Mm -hmm. He makes it a little bit better by saying that he wanted to turn back immediately, but he ran into Snatchers. And they ask, what is a Snatcher? thankfully, so the reader can understand what yeah. Ron means. And we learn that Snatchers are people that are trying to find anyone that looks like they might be a Muggleborn to bring them into the Ministry, because the Ministry is now offering a reward to bring in anyone that's unregistered as a Muggleborn, which is some super creepy Hitler shit. And it's not great, but Ron says he was able to fight them off, and he mentioned that he even was able to get a wand off of them, which in a couple of pages will become very important. Mm -hmm. Hermione asks how he found them, and the reason she asks this is so that they can be sure to throw him off the scent in the future, which I think is very fun. But he says that he could hear Hermione out of what he calls the deluminator, which I will always defend and say should be the put outer instead. Yeah, I, I love the My put big theory name. is that the deluminator was just J.K. Rowling finally realizing, oh, I came up with a very dumb name for this thing. Let me just try to sweep this under the rug and maybe no one it's will a notice. Deluminate. No, it's a deluminator. It's totally been the deluminator the whole time. Don't read the first chapter of book one or the middle of book five. Nope, <laughs> don't do it. I like the put outer. It's, I'm it's sure. dumb and it's stupid, but stick by your dumb, stupid name. Yes. Don't try to rewrite it. And even if you do rewrite it, write something in that says something where Harry goes, oh, I thought it was called the put is outer. It, is it, has it never been referred to as a deluminator like since then? Or is it just Dumbledore who like thinks of it and refers to it as the put outer? So that's the thing. The, yes. This has become many an argument with me on Twitter and stuff. Usually when, people, when people argue with me on Twitter and stuff, I'm usually like very nice. When people get put uh -huh. out over deluminator, I'm very serious because it's the uh -huh. one thing I think I have the right answer to. But basically, yeah, that is a theory that Really, it's just narrator Harry calling it the put outer. And what some people postulate is that he didn't know the name of it, which I think is complete hey. bullshit. Because yeah, when I don't know the name sense. of something, I don't make up a name for it. Like if I eat a thing of food that I don't know what it's called, I'm not oh. just like, oh yeah, this is, you know, Flurgle Blob. Like, no, you don't just make up names for things. I do. You do? Oh, absolutely. I usually ask people what things Although are called. Although I do have like several catch-all names for things that I don't know what they are. Like doohickey? Doozle. Yeah, but Harry's not calling things put outer all the time. No, it's true. <laughs> and then, or like the like twitchy thingy, you know, like sure. you like describe the thing that it does. Mm -hmm. What is, okay, so what is the mention of the put outer in the fifth book? It's when Moody uses it. The and... narrator calls it the put outer. It's the narrator. So no oh. human ever says it out loud. The big thing that trips me up is that it's put outer with a capital P and capital O. Uh. So it's not like he's just calling it the thingy or the clicker or yeah. the doohickey, yeah. which would be lowercase. No, no, no. He gives it a proper noun that's, name. I don't, that's that's not what I'm arguing. I sure. think that, like, I don't know, man. I think that, like, I wonder, uh, no. There's I a think lot it's just of, inconsistent. Yeah, and that's I'm what I think it is. And I'm to justify it. There's a that's lot of different theories. Some people have said that, it, like, it's a yeah. prototype or the put outer is the general term and Dumbledore calls his the deluminator or the, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. Well, doesn't, <laughs> I mean, doesn't Rufus... Scrimgeour say that it's like when he's like talking about giving those items to the kids mm -hmm. anyway during Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he says it's one of a kind. Will. Yeah, he's like it's w possibly one of a kind, possibly yeah. unique. Yeah. Yeah. What a weirdo. This will also be one of the stupid questions I asked J.K. Rowling when I <laughs> eventually get the interview, yeah. which she will cancel after my second I question. You know, I like my personal headcanon, which is that like a put outer is what Dumbledore called it in his head, uh -huh. and that the Ministry decide like labeled oh, it a deluminator, ooh. and that's why the seventh book in it's entirely. <laughs> 
Ah. Like, called a deluminator because Rufus Scrimgeour calls it a deluminator mm. and everybody's like, well, that sounds legitimate. Yeah. The one thing was I just don't get why Harry blindly accepted when Scrimgeour called it the deluminator. If narrator Harry calls it the put-outer twice, yeah. why didn't Harry, when he got the deluminator, why didn't he go, oh, I thought the thing was called the put-outer? And Does that's the opportunity. Does he remember that it... It's the same thing? I think so, because he's seen it before. Okay. He saw it in the fifth book. Yeah. Right. And not in the first, okay. but he did in the fifth. But, like, yeah, the fifth book. And that's also J.K. Rowling's like opportunity out. to write it in. All Harry has to do is say, I thought it was called the put-outer. And then Scrimger or Hermione or Ron is like, oh, no, it's yeah. this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. shouldn't be that hard. Okay. Which is why I think it is J.K. Rowling just trying to sweep it the under the rug. The Don't pay attention to this bad name I gave this thing. <laughs> it's totally been the deluminator. No one will remember. No one will start a podcast and I be a snarky like piece of shit the whole time. I like a put-outer, too. So. Okay. Ron says that he heard them through the put outer. He heard her say Ron and something about a wand, and Harry realizes that it's the first time they mentioned his name since he left. So clearly there is something in there that whenever they talk about Ron, they can hear it. And this makes sense because Dumbledore explicitly gave this thing to Ron, <laughs> and this could be the connection. So Ron says he clicked it and the lights went out, but another light showed outside of his window and it was a ball of pulsing blue light, similar to that that surrounds a portkey. So he followed the ball, it then went inside of him, and he got a feeling that he knew it would take him where he needed to go, so he just disapparated, and it took Yo, him- that is a convenient prototype device. Very, okay. very, very. <laughs> There's a lot of things convenient in the Harry Potter books, but uh, that yeah. this one works super well. So he disapparates and reappears at the point when they first moved earlier, in this chapter and that was the voice slash person that they heard slash saw yeah so he then when they left he went again and and but he he splinched his fingernails along the way which Ooh, hermione yeah. gives him crap for which is amazing Legit. she's like oh no if only we had just lost fingernails not almost been murdered by a big snake he then was walking through the forest and saw the silver doe thing. Then he found Harry, et cetera, et cetera. When Ron gets to the part of the story where he's going to tell Hermione about them destroying the Horcrux, it's about to get to the part where he has to tell them about the creepy Harry and Hermione coming out of the locket. But Harry just butts in and just cuts to, and then Ron stabbed it, which is such sword. a good bro move just yeah. to <laughs> avoid the awkward conversation. Like, nope. He's like, ah. Like, I don't want to be a part of this. I really don't want to be a part of this. I don't think. <laughs> I think you should go there. Like we're gonna we don't need to discuss while we're this. Ahead. Nope, 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 nope. I don't think we have to do this at all. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's the way to go. It's totally um, the way to go. Yes, although like it's like the one of four times when Harry is like emotional intelligence mm -hmm. actually serves yeah. him well, as opposed to like, dude, your emotional intelligence could use some. Refining. <laughs> so they then call it a night. They separate. They're all going to bed and stuff. And Ron whispers to Harry. Uh, Ron and Harry talk about how, oh, you know, that could have gone worse. And Ron says, yeah, remember the birds? And Hermione says, I still haven't ruled them out. And then Ron goes to bed smiling because now they're back to playful witty yelling at each other and not punching you repeatedly for leaving. And that's the end of chapter 19. That's yeah. the end of this episode of Potterless. Now that they've yelled about it. Yeah. Fine. So, Cece, how are you feeling about these two chapters? Yo, dude, these are like some epic chapters. Yeah, There's a lot of stuff. There's so much happening and mm -hmm. so much information going on. And honestly, like, the seventh book is just a lot of setup. Sure. There's like so much information that has to come out before Endgame mm -hmm. occurs. Yeah. That it's like, it. I don't know. I think it's always going to be. It's like one of my least favorite books, frankly. Okay. Um, I've heard people have similar frustrations. Yeah, with Yeah, I think that's true. There's just like there's no, there's not a lot of relaxation time. Mm -hmm. And you're right. The beginning is a lot of taking it in. I'm confused, and I'll be mm -hmm. interested to see the first book seven movie. Because yeah. Where does it stop? Have I gotten uh, to the part where it stops yet or no? You know, I honestly can't remember. Okay. Yeah. I just, I'm very confused because I've read how many pages of this book now and it feels like nothing has happened yet. Yeah. This is the most thing to happen is they finally killed a Horcrux and we're more than halfway through the book. Yes. Feels like a lot of setup. No, it's just like the worst camping trip ever. Yeah. For like 400 pages mm -hmm. and then there's a, <laughs> then end game. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so I, I guess in my That's brain, all. if this is what the first Wedding, movie is... really bad camping trip. Mm-hmm. Endgame. <laughs> yeah. It feels like the first movie is going to be like, oh, wow, this is awful. And then the seventh yeah. movie is just going to be like two hours of so many things are happening. Yeah. So, well, well, you know, like there's a decent amount of action that happens in here that keeps the first half of the seventh movie. Mm-hmm. Pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean... like I think it's important to read and understand and get through but I mean at this point the world is sort of built Mm -hmm. and established like there are not that many more like fun tidbits that are coming out Uh right like that we can like Mm -hmm. joke about and make fun of it's just like everybody's character flaws allowing for more plot points yeah it's trying times for my very silly podcast yeah (laughs) (laughs) It's like, oh no, this book is so sad oh, and serious. Oh no. yeah. Yeah. And honestly, like I I think that it reads like when I'm reading it to myself, like there mm-hmm. this is like the Frodo and Sam wandering around in Mordor part mm-hmm. that like nobody admits to skipping. Ooh, okay. Except that my mom kind of introduced those books to me going uh-huh. So Cece, I really think that it's totally legitimate <laughs> to just kind of flip through those parts and get back to the battle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will say I I'm only halfway through the second movie, mm. but I have been very bored. I don't know if that's the part you're referring to, but I am I'm bored of the like Sam and Frodo just kind of like hiking yeah. around. It's like I want to see people fighting stuff. Whoa, there, past Mike, you're about to catch a lot of flack for this. Hey, what's up? It's editing, Mike. You will go on to say that it's because you were watching the very long extended director's cut. But before you go and clarify that point, I think it's a little time for something that we like to call Wingardium at Redos. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Wix. Look, you want a website, and you want your website to look pretty. Unfortunately, the fullest extent of your web design knowledge is copy-pasting those cool things you could add to your MySpace page, but you have no idea how that HTML coding actually works. To you, it looks like you're on the Matrix, and it's just a bunch of symbols that don't actually mean anything. Well... That's where Wix comes in, because Wix can help you make an absolutely stunning website, whether you are making it from scratch and you actually know what you're doing, or if you want to use one of their 500 incredible templates. I use Wix for Potterless's website and for Horse's website, and it is incredibly easy to use, and I am very biased, but I think both websites are absolutely gorgeous. With Wix, you have access to all of their design features. With a free account, there's no trial, there's no time limit, you can make your website look as pretty as you want. To. And then if you want to upgrade, you can get Wix Premium and get access to a whole bunch of new features. And you lovely listeners can get 10% off that Wix upgrade if you use the promo code Potterless at Wix.com. Setting up your Wix website is super simple. Their design templates are very intuitive to customize, and they have a ton of amazing features like great SEO tools. So again, go to Wix.com and use promo code Potterless to get 10% off any Wix premium plan and start making an amazing website. Maybe you just remake your old MySpace page today. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Stitch Fix. Let's say hypothetically that you are on the run from the devil and his band of goons, and you're trying to find a way to destroy capsules of his soul throughout the world but you don't know where they are and one of your friends left but came back well you're gonna need new clothes right because you obviously don't have access to a laundromat or a washing machine of any sorts and you don't have time to go shopping and if you go into a store maybe let's say his group of friends is called the death eaters the death eaters might want to destroy and slash or kill you well That's where Stitch Fix comes into play because Stitch Fix can send you personalized boxes of clothes right to your door, even if that door is constantly on the move. Stitch Fix is absolutely fantastic. I love all of the clothes that they've sent me. And last time we had them sponsor an episode, Kelly talked about some of the clothes that she had. Well, she loved everything and she didn't get to talk about all of them. So Kelly, why don't you take it away and talk about some more of the clothes you got? They sent me two tops that I love so much that Mike has forced me to stop wearing them so that I can wash them. And I also got a cute little side bag. One thing that I really like is that everything that I ordered can be worn as an outfit altogether. So I have a 
cool new outfit to wear. I can switch out the top to make it either a little more casual or a little more classy. Wow, thank you, Kelly, so much. And if that sounds great, you can get on board to listeners and get a special discount if you go to stitchfix.com slash potterless. You will get 25% off your entire box if you keep everything from your box. So again, go to stitchfix.com slash potterless, fill up the quiz to the best of your ability so that your stylist knows you very well, leave your stylist a personalized note so that your box is as perfect as it can be, and if you keep everything, you'll get 25% off. Go for it so you can look good while you fight the devil today! Yeah, so, you, you, again, we're probably going to catch flack for this, but, like, flat, fast forward through that. <laughs> yeah, you have to take your booper and, and click it. Click it. Yeah, I'm also, halfway, it I'm also halfway through the extended director's cut version. So, I think that it's really important to watch at least some of them, especially in the second Lord of the Rings okay. movie. Good. For the director's cut. In Return of the King... Mm-hmm. I think it's totally fair to skip basically all of it unless okay. you see fire and lava okay. and like, you know, they're at Mount Doom, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> oh, by the way, they get to Mount Doom. Yes, I figured they oh, would. Oh, cool. Yeah. No, they get to Mount Doom. Yeah. So, yes, that, I don't know. I mean, okay. like, this is like the whole Forest of Dean mm-hmm. sadness land, yeah. um, but the, like, Batilda Bagshot stuff or like... Harry's, like, feelings about Dumbledore are, I think, honestly, like, to me, the most important part, or, like, the most interesting parts to me are mm-hmm. Harry's feelings about Dumbledore and the information that we get about Dumbledore's past. Yes. Also, how important that is to it being a coming-of-age tale. <laughs> you know, in that, like, Harry, like all of Harry's idols are getting killed dead. Mm-hmm. And resuscitated in a new way. And, like, a major part of growing up is being able to see, like, your, like parental figures mm-hmm. as human beings sure. who yeah, are yeah. complex and stuff mm-hmm. and like that's what is happening here yeah look at you harry yeah <laughs> it's it's not that fun and yeah. then it's done yeah and it, you go personal evolution I don't, yeah it's just a lot of personal evolution. Mm-hmm. I feel like while the momentum people are running around trying to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the momentum is building now that they've killed a Horcrux and Ron yes. is back. I'm like, okay, cool. Now stuff's gonna yeah, go exactly. down. So yeah, no, these are the last two like kind of introspective e chapters. What's the next one? Uh, I, I won't share. blush, but you can just look so you. Wait, I can't even read the. You can read the title, sure. Title, okay. Then. <sighs> <laughs> my sister is called dibs on this chapter um, years in advance yes <laughs> yes i was like somebody snagged all the good chapters in this book um yeah no this is amazing okay cool, cool. i'm yes. excited you were in good shape good i'm sorry to put you through some gruesome ones but at oh, least no, we got at we least had we a got a horcrux murder time. Yeah. we did get a horcrux murder it screamed mm-hmm. and yeah i don't know well i think that's like Eh, this is like another piece of like, what kind of evil is Voldemort? Mm-hmm. You know, because at this point he is like, what is it that Dumbledore says? Beyond the realms of normal evil. Ooh. Or what we might call normal evil. <laughs> um, yeah, no, like the nature of Voldemort's evil is always like kind of like fascinating and interesting. Mm-hmm. And like hearing how people put together what evil is is always like really interesting. Mm-hmm. Especially since like, I spend a lot of time like thinking about like villains and like sure. what makes a villain a right. villain. And, you like, played one. What, yeah, <laughs> I played one for a long time, and there was like a, also always like somebody that was going to eventually be a non-villain. Mm-hmm. And so like getting to that point of like what is villainry and what is yeah. true villainry mm-hmm. and like what is untrue villainry <laughs> and what is villainry that sticks and like. That at some point Voldemort passed beyond the point where he was just like a power hungry, insecure little shit to mm-hmm. like something that is like a conduit and a vessel for like reminding people of their insecurities and like yeah. ensuring that they wallow in them forever yeah. is like a very interesting thing. And I think that that is like as we like find these horcruxes and get at them, each of them has like a different window onto like the shittiness that is like 
the damage that we do to ourselves. Yeah, because we've seen it kind of play on that for Ginny and now for Ron. Exactly. That's yeah, the evil right? that kind of plays on you. Is yeah. like that little voice diary, inside your what head are the and amplifying we've it. Met so far, like just the diary, the diary and the locket. And the locket are the only ones that have been split. And then the mm-hmm. ring, we don't know anything about. Yeah, we just know it is one. And then we yeah. like maybe know the cup might be one or whatever, yeah, but we but don't we know about them. Met them. So like, sure. but these two guys so far are like really strongly playing on that tiny voice in your head that exactly. tells you mean things and like. Yeah. Amplifying that is the worst thing mm-hmm. because, like, you are your own worst enemy. Yeah, that, like, exactly. And it's just like, let me make this the loudest voice you can hear. Yeah. And, and honestly, like, I would argue that, like, a strong voice on that is, like, maybe one of the things that turned Voldemort to pursue mm. beyond the bounds of normal evil in the first place. Hearing one of those. It's like a fear of what death yeah. and a hunger for power. Mm hmm. Like, mm. that is just, like, looking to become invincible, which is not that far from not wanting to spend time with shitty voices in your head yeah. by yourself. Ugh. Deep stuff, intense stuff, we're getting I mean, into it. I mean, like, some weird chapters <laughs> yeah. camping in the woods. Yeah, For sure. Like, they're really, they're real, there's a lot going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Not so much on the happy fun times. I no. love that Hermione gets to beat the shit out of Ron. Good. That should happen he way it. more often. He deserves Not it for being like a big prick. Not in an abusive way, but like, but like in a, he's a jerk way. Satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, man. Yeah. Well, is there anything you would like to promote to the fine listeners of Potterless? You do fun voice acting stuff. We voice acted together on Time Bombs, and we it was a great did. time. Oh, it was really good. It was like, well, first of all, Time Bombs was fun. Sure. I'm glad we got to do that because yeah. I got to meet you. Yes. That was great. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. <laughs> um, and then what else? Oh, I'm doing like a crazy dance theater like expanded media project. We basically, my dance partner and I invented a contemporary dance. Sweet. Artist, like a fake one. And okay. And made her fake angsty tumblr blog fun and what is it it's called dear god it's me celine.tumblr.com sweet celine is moved to move Ooh. Um, so yeah i'm shooting a film for that fun. this weekend um i was just on a comedy tv show that i don't think i can talk about okay yet. that's fine um but it's a very very small thing but it should be funny cool um and yeah. then wolf 359 if you want to go back and then wolf 359 mm-hmm. that, which you, if you haven't listened to that already what you are you it, doing you maybe give it a listen and it's see what good. you think mm-hmm. um yeah Cool. That's, a, that's about what I'm doing in my life so far. Wonderful. Well, yeah. I'm glad that you stopped by. Cheers. Thanks for being here. Listeners, oh, thanks, thanks for, for listening. Yeah. And as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter before they shank horcruxes with a big sword, a wizard on! <laughs> <laughs> that's what Ron should have said. Like, mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had people message me that they want to support Potterless, but financially they can't join the Patreon or something like that. You don't have to. A great way to help the show is by talking about it, whether that's through an iTunes review, talking about it on social media, telling someone you know in real life, hey, you should listen to this podcast. That helps the show so incredibly much. So if you want to just do that, that is so important and would make my heart smile. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert, as well as Lee and Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Colin Bauer, Jesse Horgan, that Clovercharge, Deborah Wilkins, Klauser Lupu, Rebecca Adamek, Frank Chiodo, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Jenna Dowsick, Kieran Webb, Abita Med, Caitlin Jordan Pontolo, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Marie Lisa Seekeen, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivdanira, Camille Doc, Russell Dunk, Dustin Willem Cooch, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Sidney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Andrea Franz, Nikki to Power, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Love Cash Longer, Ali Madsen, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Amelia Krauss, Sean Montag, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Jessica Ann, Arnica the Daughter, Tiago Costic, Daisy Carton, Sutter, Jessica Jacob, Orchard Grower, Steve Trelor, Vivian the Owl, Takari Aron, Haley Hastings, Marino, Moster, Pinky Pan, Angelina Withred, Ross Marie Heise, Finis Ebner, Lee Ganji Singh, Alex Bashulta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Finn Stuckey, Mosin Siddiqui, Grace Riggle, Sammy Shaw, Raul Pineda, Ingan Oddstotter, Mary Wynn, Brianne Wingate, Heidi Stoll, Alexander Consulver, John Cotker, Jen and Juice, Noel Basile, Tao, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin Fernandez, Patricia Cologne, Will Barrington, Liz Bigelow, Mariah Noah, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Enslin, Claire Spencer, Teal, Cena Schutzeberg, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Donafont, Alec Cat29, Hallie Bowen, 
Dylan, Veronica Bartova, Kevin Harnoy, Lada B, Noah, Tracy Toya, Lucinda, Carlos Nino, Pam Webb, Nikki Emio, Colleen King, Jennifer Marklu, Frida J. Svetson, Idor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Tyler Latra, Summer Raffle, Heather Fleischman, Vera Cullitham, Carrie D. Bagasid, Andrea Crock, Elisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Emily Gale, Ryan King, Cameron Watkins, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Tooth the Small Note Weekend at Dead Cat Ladies, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Holly Burge, Kimberly Savage, Sushant Thumne Gupta, Brittany Gutierrez, Nita Atabani, Bavi Patel, Tumnus Moran, Remy Fontaine, Mats Furley, Sarah Shecker, Lauren Cook, Nova VM, Kyle, Zina Rosnowski, Emily Tilly, Colleen Mage, Harlan Haskins, Akanksha Saxena, Wouter Van Der Maiden, Shelby Darnell, Noelia, Reese Clark, Adriana Cox, Ryan, You Can Meep Eats Waffles, Ushin Large, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campomanes. You can find us on social media at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, and instagram.com slash potterless podcast. We're also at reddit.com slash r slash potterless. And for all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com. Bonus content lives at patreon.com slash potterless. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a wizard on.